Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Ramah Khalid. But today is the 29th of September 2022. These are the stories that we will be discussing in detail uh, during the course of the show. We'll begin with the, the huge victory for uh, the PMLN. Uh, as the Islamabad High Court has overturned uh, the conviction of uh, Maryam Nawaz and Captain Savdar in the Avonfield case. Uh, uh, four years after both of them had been convicted, they are now, uh, uh, the, the whole case against them has been dropped by uh, the IHC. Uh, and it is a very important development as far as uh, the PML is concerned is also uh, all the questions that had been raised by the previous government against uh, Maryam uh, Safdar, Maryam Nawaz, as well as uh, Captain Safdar. All of those questions have now been uh, put to a light, uh, put in the clear by the Islamabad High Court. And this is going to be our first segment, the overturning of uh, the conviction of both Maryam Nawaz and Captain Sarwar in the Avonfield case, in the 2018 Avonfield case, four years after they were convicted, they are now free of this case. Secondly, the National Security Committee has also approved the constitution of a high-level committee to probe the recently surfaced audio leaks. These, of course, these leaks feature carried conversations between key figures uh, uh, and uh, also talk about uh, uh, the former prime minister and his advisor talking in detail about a certain important events and uh, what is going to be unearthed as a result of that this is uh, a very important the whole unearthing of the audio leaks is also extremely important on in the wake of all the accusations that had been put towards the current coalition government especially the pmln this is going to be our leading story in fact this leading story has two important components and uh, then we are going to talk about two uh, issues first of course is the prominent human rights group that says that the facebook owner meta uh, owes uh, the rohingya uh, reparations for the platform's role in fueling violence against the mostly muslim minority in uh, myanmar this is amnesty international that has uh, put the blame on Meta, Meta that owns Facebook, Meta that owns a lot of other companies as well. It has uh, issued the call for compensation after accusing Meta of failing to act, despite the activists repeatedly warning the company about the implications of the anti-Rohingya hate speech on the Facebook platform. And finally, we are going to talk about the World Maritime Day that is being observed today. This year, the theme of the day is new technologies for greener shipping. Of course, it's very important in this whole era of a uh, clean and green uh, world. So the, even our uh, Navy is going towards a uh, greener shipping. Uh, this is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first story, ladies and gentlemen. And that concerns, in fact, two important uh, issues. The first being the overturning of uh, the uh, 2018 conviction in the Avonfield case uh, uh, against uh, Captain Savda and Mariam Nawaz. Both uh, are now free as far as this very important case is concerned as the Islamabad High Court has overturned the decision, uh, the conviction of uh, both of these leaders uh, in uh, that uh, decision that had been taken way back in 2018. Uh, Justice Kiani says the joint investigation team did not present any facts. In fact, a lot of question marks are also emanating as far as the role of the National Accountability Bureau at that time is concerned. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of congratulatory messages following uh, the whole uh, con uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the conviction being overturned uh, in the Islamabad High Court, whether it be leaders uh, of the PMLN, whether it be uh, the former uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, or whether it be the current Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif, all have congratulated and have tweeted uh, about uh, this uh, uh, overturning of this very important conviction uh, against uh, uh, Maryam Nawaz as well as uh, uh, Captain uh, Savdar. Uh, we've been joined by Barrister Safi Allah Ghori, who's a legal expert, to talk more about the legal aspects of it all. Uh, uh, Safi, thank you very much to have joined us. Safi, uh, when you look at the whole uh, uh, Avonfield case from 2018 to 2022, to begin with, what were the loopholes in that case? So, uh, this is a very interesting case, Omar, and um, one that is quite close to my heart as well for a variety of reasons. When uh, Zu Deutsche Zeitung, the German newspaper, came up with Panama Leaks, I was obsessed with them. And at that point of time, I was one of the first lawyers in the country. In fact, I was the first one to file a case against Captain Safdar uh, at that point of time through my client, Captain um, Nawab Adha Salahuddin, against whom Captain Safdar appears. So it's a case in which I have had a personal stake. Uh, 
um so of course i mean at the time of filing that case uh, there was this entire matter and issue of uh, where they got the property from now how, whether this was proven or not proven was then eventually decided when um, the judgment has come out now but it's interesting i mean you asked me a very interesting question about what the loopholes were and i have been following this case closely one thing is very clear nab did not prepare this case properly as nab never really does with any uh, particular case nab has an abysmal prosecution rate i mean i think close to 98% of all nab cases end up in acquittals and rightly so because nab is a vindictive authority uh, i think this one case if it has if it will have its biggest impact will be that on nab nab as a watchdog as a regulator because this was nab's flagship case this was the case that put nab on the map before that nab wasn't really such a big organization after that nab's powers were expanded nab started its reign of terror started capturing everyone and anyone around and uh, of course this is this is a very important case for another reason which is the fact that you know this case led to the disqualification of former prime minister nawaz sharif and paved the way for imran khan to come in as the next prime minister so right. it, safi safi what i'd like to understand is do you feel that it's a unique case the whole this whole avonfield case as far as nab's 20 year history is concerned do you feel there are certain peculiarities that highlighted this case in in the eyes of uh, the world in the eyes of uh, the pakistani governance in the eyes of the different organizations in pakistan and in the eyes of the nab and the judicial system as well of course it's a unique case umar because this is a case this was a very high power case right at the end of the day this case talks about the kind of corruption that the richest of the rich do so when when the panama leaks came out there was this whole issue uh, and you know as as you might remember the panama leaks were all about you know a law firm's leak mossack fonseca and when those panama leaks came out there was an important issue and uh, that issue was why do rich people have companies in panama these are offshore companies and what do those companies own so for instance one company that they had fzd holding in dubai which also had a subsidiary in panama was the owner of the evanfield apartments that much was proven the question really then became and this was an important question at the time and still is as in in a day and age when we have money laundering going on all over and uh, the black money is uh, and the black economy itself is perhaps larger than the white economy at the moment so the question really then comes in where, where did this money come from how were these apartments bought and i think that has been a failing of nab because nab and the fia have completely failed to prosecute in the chaudhry sugar mills case which was the money laundering case because they could not prosecute on that case therefore the evanfield apartment case could not go through of course there were there were several loopholes as well i mean the way this entire trial was conducted one can one can clearly say that this was a one sided trial the way it was being um, carried out the way the judgments were uh, carried out were doled out were also very harsh uh, 10 years for nawaz sharif 8 years and imprisonment for maryam nawaz these were very harsh punishments uh, without sufficient evidence without proving all the all the matters that need to be proven but uh, i have mixed feelings about this case you you you're probably you know realizing how i am somewhat emotional about this and i am emotional about it for the simple reason that this case will will to a large degree change the way pakistani jurisprudence works uh, it's positive it's positive because there will be an increased reliance on evidence there will be lesser reliance on conjectures which we have seen in the past um i also believe that this case will lead to many other uh, fanciful cases being dismissed which have which were then filed and during the same time and overall i do feel that this case is a step in the right direction by the islamabad high court and right, let's uh, talk about let's let's talk about another angle of this case was this case to begin with politically motivated uh it's uh, so uh, of course uh, or one used uh, used in that aspect so i uh, so let's 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 go back to where this case came from right and then we can decide whether this was politically All motivated right. or so so the panama leaks came out now panama leaks were not politically motivated that much i think we can all agree upon all right that there was an independent journalist who exposed mm. how rich and powerful people stash away their money on off in offshore companies so and when the panama leaks came out the names of nawaz sharif and his family were sticking out like sore thumbs because they were one of the world leaders prime ministers there were other prime ministers as well 
but it was particularly important because at that point of time Nawaz Sharif was a serving prime minister and uh, and so he got a lot of international press and coverage so one cannot say that there was any political party behind uh, that kind of coverage at that point of time it it did it did raise a massive question as to why a serving prime minister has companies abroad which have secret funds and secret properties and assets in them now and and this was of course uh, to be compared to the kind of statements that were being made by Maryam Nawaz who were constantly saying that we don't have any foreign companies we don't have any foreign assets and you know so there were promises and things like these so up till up till that point one can one can be clear that there was no political motivation subsequent to which this is in 2016 subsequent to which the supreme court of pakistan formed a uh, git the git investigated the case and after investigation of the the case by the git this matter blew up that is when evidence started coming in they could not give a money trail or for where these even field department came from and then we have you know of course the famous panama leak judgment in which they say behind every fortune there is a crime that's somewhat presumptuous i i do think that the court sort of went beyond the call of duty by presuming that this fortune was amassed by illegal methods but of course right. the and here's what the big problem is with this Safi, with, at Safi, that point of we, time we continue our conversation as far as uh, the judicial aspect of it all is concerned with you but we've also gotten a balak sher khosa sahab who's an advocate supreme court on online with us uh, khosa sahab thank you very much to have uh, joined us khosa sahab uh, how do you see this uh, uh, annulment of the Islamabad uh, High Court uh, of the Maryam Nawaz's sentence in the Avonfield reference. How do you see that from a judicial aspect and from a political aspect? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. The matter is that the court sees the evidence. The court sees the documents. The court sees what is the evidence. Look, the evidence that came to the trial court, they have convinced it. It is in front of you. It, I don't need to spell it out what they have done. But in the high court, you have to see in the appellate court. Mein, Kosa sahab, uh, uh, could, could you uh, highlight uh, all of this in English if you don't mind? I'm sorry. The court has, like, the lower court has convicted Maryam Nawaz, keeping in view the evidence. You see the evidence in, uh, in Reen with the papers and the documents which is there with the court and the media and the trial which, which is going on. The court has to see okay, whether the judgment which has been given and in which the Maryam Nawaz and Saptar has been convicted is in dean with the documents, with the evidence, with the paper. So the court has to see whether the documents which are there in dean with the evidence which the prosecution has based upon because definitely the prosec it is the case of the prosecution. The prosecution has been in case against Maryam Nawaz and Safdar. That this is the case in which they are guilty. But the High Court, after scrutinizing, I repeat, High Court is a court of appellate jurisdiction in which they have scrutinized. Yes, there is no case against Maryam and Safdar. So keeping in view chair, six years, they have like... He barred them from the political activities and all that. She might have been in the Senate. She might have been the Prime Minister of this country. But keeping in view the conviction which the trial court has made in keeping in view the evidence, which the High Court keeping in view the cracking out the evidence which has not been proved, definitely that leads into acquittal. So that's why they have a right of appealing before the Supreme Court of Pakistan and Supreme Court, I am telling you very loud and clear, I am a Supreme Court lawyer, very, I have been appearing before the Supreme Court of Pakistan in which we go against the judgment of the High Court in such like cases in which the Supreme Court always says okay, what is wrong, what is lacking in the judgment which the High Court has laid down. So, it is the prosecution, the government has to prove what is wrong in the judgment as regards Maryam, Nawaz and Sabdar. All right. Uh, Khosa sahab, also would you like to uh, highlight how important this, the, this decision is as far as jurisprudence, judiciary uh, in Pakistan is concerned and the future of any such decisions that could be taken? You see, such like judgments are very, very common in Pakistan. 
the late Shaheed Mohtarma Benazir Bhutto, in which you know that I don't need to spell out what happened and she was being convicted and she was being barred from the politics and in the Supreme Court of Pakistan, it was being stashed out and abolished the judgment against the Mohtarma Benazir Bhutto. Likewise, against uh, like Mohtarma Mariam Nawaz and Sattar, you see, here if somebody, I am so shocked, I am so embarrassed, I am sh- you see, the people of Pakistan so embarrassed, if a judgment laid down by a like uh, any officer of the court, any uh, like judicial uh, who is holding the uh, like roots of convicting or acquitting somebody, if he or she convicts anybody and afterwards 10, 7, 8 years, he or she is being acquitted, for God's sake, where her or his 10 years, 6 years are gone. So likewise is the case with the Marim Nawaz Shri. You see, mm. she has a right for the purpose of defamation suit against the person who have like defamed her and the husband. So I think so. The Pakistan Bar Council has already, already made an, a, 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 a suit for legislation before the parliament. So for God's sake, this needs to be amended now. You see, innocent people cannot be convicted. Even Mia mm. Muhammad Nawaz Sharif, even Mariam Nawaz Sharif, you see, there has to get an end to this. You need to prove. You need to have an evidence. You need to have the document which lack in the case of Mariam Nawaz Sharif. All right. Kindly stay on line with us, Balak Sheikh Khosa Sahib. Uh, we have to go back to our other guest, uh, Safiullah Hori, Barrister Safiullah Hori, in fact. Uh, you've just heard what Khosa Sahib had to say. Would you like to add something to that? What Khosa Saab has said, I, at the end of the day, it comes down to evidence. Um, this, there's not much that can be said about the present judgment, by the way, Omar. And not much can be said because the detailed judgment is not yet out. Right now, all we have is a short order by Justice Mohsen Akhtar Kiani and Amir Faru, wherein they've stated that for reasons to be recorded later, um, they, will, um, they will be uh, dealing with the application, but the application for acquittal is accepted. And we'll be, of course have to wait for the detailed judgment to see what the honorable court saw that resulted in this acquittal, so that we can we can of course understand for ourselves and see what the uh, what the judicial mind was uh, how the judicial mind was used. But that said, of course, at the end of the day, it is the duty of the courts to dispense justice and to dispense justice based on evidence and nothing other than evidence. It cannot be any political inclinations. It cannot be matters that may or may somehow uh, derail the country or in any manner establish a certain political dynasty. So I, I believe that the court is giving neutral judgments. It's the same courts that a couple of days ago also relieved Imran Khan from uh, uh, the contempt of court that was pending against him. It's also the same court that relieved Imran Khan from the terrorism charges that were uh, trumped up against him and the court dismissed them with a lot of anger saying that these should not be used in vain so it's very clear that the courts are giving very balanced judgments and they're giving relief oriented judgments so instead of prosecuting instead of um, instead of being um, vindictive like we have seen some judges in the past these courts seem to be more inclined towards giving liberal reliefs to the people and also to the politicians so that the political discourse takes place in the parliament and not in the courts. It's very interesting that you talk of political discourse, Safi, and I'd like to ask the following question from you and Khosa Saab. Uh, firstly, I'll start with you, Safi. Uh, when you uh, call of political dispensation, we all know the pressure tactics that a certain party has put on the judiciary when, uh, things, uh, uh, when decisions come against uh, the said party. Uh, do you feel that decisions such as these will pave the way for a stronger uh, uh, judiciary? This judiciary is already strong, but not uh, coming under pressure from uh, parties such as the one that I've just talked about, PTI. Um, I, I, so, uh, and absolutely, you're very rightly corrected out how political parties try to dissuade the courts from doing what they are. But being a lawyer, and this is my personal observation, I find the courts to be quite independent. And they are, in fact, one of the most independent institutions within the country, and for good reason. The reason is that political parties come and go, judges tend to stay. This this is a constitutional position. They There are, in fact, only two, realistically, there are only 
two positions where you tend to maintain a modicum of power. One is the courts and one is the military. For the simple reason that you tend to stay for a much longer time, you cannot be removed. You are not under any threats of uh, getting fired, getting toppled over, like political governments, like a bureaucrat can be changed. So because because they are not liable to these kind of changes, they can they can sit and they can pass their judgments with relative ease and liberty. And that's what we see in particular with the courts. That the courts, Pakistan has for for a long time been even termed as a judiciocracy. It's it's not a very bad term, by the way, in the context of Pakistan, because the judiciary has been shaping the law. In in most countries that are democratic, parliament shaped the law. Uh, we give legal opinions on a daily basis, and we realize that parliamentary laws are simply not sufficient. In fact, the majority of laws seem to be coming from Supreme Court decisions. So it's fair to say that the law giving authority is the court. And if if one was to then presume that. It is not the parliament. The role of the parliament has, to a degree, been usurped by the courts. Then one also has to believe that the courts do so independent of influences by the parliament, because oh, like they uh, they outclassed parliamentary leaders for for that reason. All right, Khosa Sahab, what's your what's your opinion on uh, on uh, this point that I've raised with Safi? Listen, the parliament is in accordance with the law. It has nothing doing any. Like a rubber stamp with the parliament, because in parliament they have very clearly said so. If there is any evidence, I'll repeat. I think so. We need to read the law. We need to read the constitution, which I all of you lack. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to spell it. You see, the parliament and the parliament and the parliamentary committee and the constitution would clearly and loudly say if anything repugnant to constitution, Islam. It has to be struck down. But if anything which is in line with the constitution, in case with the Marim Nawaz Sharif, you see, if there is any evidence against her, absolutely the, wherever you see, the Islamabad High Court is not a rubber stamp. The judges are not a rubber stamp. They are qualified to be the judge of High Court, and then to go into the Supreme Court of Pakistan, and then to be the Chief Justice of Supreme Court of Pakistan. You see. What the judgment they have they have said so. What I have read the short part of the judgment, absolutely in line with the constitution. So it has nothing doing as a rubber stamp. All right. I mean, of course, we all we all know that, but it's I was just I was trying to understand uh, as far as political dispensation and judiciary is concerned, how interlinked are they, and uh, how uh, uh, much decisions like these have strengthened the judiciary further. You see, I would love to say that, being uh, it's my beginning in this profession. I don't know, it is my beginning. It is my 24th year. I have been struggling and learning from media, from judgment, from judiciary. It is just my beginning, and as per my beginning, this judgment is never going to crack down by the Supreme Court of Pakistan because right. there has to be a solid reason. All right. Uh, uh, Safi, coming to you, uh, the NAB law was amended recently. Do you feel that has also helped the de this uh, decision making by uh, the Islamabad High Court? It's possible. Uh, uh, once again, we don't know if this judgment came in the light of the recent NAB amendments. Uh, th there is a possibility, of course, that it would have happened. But if if that were to be the case, I would definitely welcome it because the amendment to the NAB law were much needed. And uh, what were the amendments? I think if, if if I were to just quickly go back and uh, review the amendments in partic uh, particularly in in connection with this case so and and what you have what what it did is it brought back to nab law the very basic principle of justice which is that the burden of proof lies on the person who accuses not the other way around so uh, so what was happening with with uh, you know innocent until proven guilty is what the maxim is that we use what happened? Norm, what happens normally is you're innocent. The prosecution has to come forward and prove that you're guilty, and then based on that, if uh, you know the prosecution is able to prove with evidence that you are guilty, then you are guilty. NAB law was a very uh, uh, an example of a very draconian and a very repressive and a very repulsive law in the sense that it reversed the burden of proof. It said that you are guilty until proven innocent. So. 
so if nav catches you you're guilty you know this is it's just as simple as that you know and and ayo come comes gets you now you're guilty now you have to go to the court and now you have to somehow prove that you were not guilty uh the amendment changes that burden of proof back to nab and says that it is the duty of nab to establish and show to the the satisfaction of the court that corruption has been done and corruption has been done in terms of monetary gains and that the person who they are accusing was directly involved in that corruption you cannot just randomly say that so for instance in for instance in this particular case nab should have shown a direct connection between the evanfield apartments and maryam nawaz sharif now they can if they went to the court previously and they said you know Maryam Nawaz Sharif is the daughter of Nawaz Sharif there is an Evanfield apartment which is in the name of Hassan and Hussain Nawaz so therefore Maryam is guilty that's not sufficient anymore you mm-hmm. need to show that it was Maryam Nawaz who went and bought those apartments and they were in her name so mm-hmm. you cannot work on presumptions anymore and so this is why the law has now been corrected and i i repeat nab has had a reign of terror nab was given this this free reign all over the country which has resulted in madness because this was not even law this was this was an abomination of justice uh, what nab was doing for a very very long time so to come back to basic principles of justice where uh, things that we have learned as students of law can finally be applied and be seen to be applied by the courts is actually a relief and i am very happy that such things are happening this is why i think it's a positive step all right uh, balafir khosa saab a final question to you uh, these amendments in the nab laws are uh, they a step in the right directions as far as as safi has pointed out the principles of justice are concerned you see we need to respect each other even if somebody is a junior i need to respect him somebody is a senior we have lost respect for that you see uh, the amendment has nothing doing with maryam nawaz case because it does not have any reciprocate amendment effect on her case i think so my brother lack on that he needs to read on that you see okay. maryam nawaz case has nothing doing with the amendment it is a case in which the prosecution lack evidence i have gone through the case i have read the case i have read each and every case of the prosecution what the allegations were against her and as per the prosecution there has been no evidence proved from the foreign government it is just a pakistani hearsay so for god sake we need to rely upon the evidence if somebody is a thief you need to see what the evidence against him or her is so as per this case if there would have been a proper evidence from united kingdom from america any state where the allegations are against her that is the case against maryam nawaz there hmm. has not been any case proved against that no evidence of what alleged by the prosecution so so she has been acquitted on the basis of the papers documents which are before the court of law for god sake stop blaming the court all right no no nobody is blaming the court uh, khosa saab we are just trying to understand the points of views and the wake of this decision that has been taken by the islamabad the high court thank you very much uh, balak sher khosa saab advocate supreme court to have joined us and to have talked to us about this uh, important decision taken by the islamabad high court safi how important is relying on evidence as far as any case is concerned whether it be under the nab or under any court of uh, of the law well of course evidence is all important it's the it's the only thing that will determine the outcome of a trial uh, so when we when we are when we have a case we use a term called balance of evidence and uh, in in criminal cases that balance of evidence is considered to be beyond reasonable doubt and in civil cases this balance of evidence is wherever it is it's heavier so in criminal cases what you need to show is you need to have evidence that is so high the the level of evidence that is required is so high that that there is not a, that there there cannot be any doubt that a particular crime took place and in a civil case for instance in a contractual matter between you and me if there is uh, you have some evidence and i have some evidence then a judge will gauge who has more evidence and then based on that they will make the decision all right so i think it's it's very important in this current scenario as well 
uh, to, uh, to lay down the bare facts and that is what the Islamabad High Court has decided in the wake of the bare facts and the, and, uh, the verdict is uh, now uh, in, uh, will be given in detail uh, shortly but we've had a short decision taken by uh, that has come out from the Islamabad High Court as far as the annulment of uh, Mariam Nawaz's sentence in the Avans Field reference is concerned. She has now been acquitted. Javed Siddiq, senior journalist, joins us online. Javed Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. It had been some time that we had talked on this very show. My, Javed Saab, how yes. do you see this decision by the Islamabad High Court? Well, it's a very important decision in the current uh, situation and current context, uh, political context as well. Because uh, Mariam Nawaz and uh, his father, the former Prime Minister, have been uh, pleading uh, with the court uh, that these cases were made up against them. They were fabricated. And they had, from the very beginning, claimed that these uh, properties which are uh, referred to in this case didn't belong to them. And uh, the NAV, I think, was unable to prove it uh, in the context of law uh, and evidence that uh, these properties belong to Nawaz Sharif or his daughter. So I think uh, NAV was uh, asked again and again by the court that do they have the tangible evidence that these properties belong to this uh, lady or her father? So they were unable to prove it, and it looks that uh, the cases which were, uh, the reference which were filed, were filed on the basis of the JIT report, uh, you know, of those days. And subsequently, NAB was unable to collect any solid evidence against them. So now the court has given them a relief, and it's a very big relief for uh, political family uh, former Prime Minister and his daughter. And I think uh, uh, they can now say that those cases which were uh, made up by, by, framed by the, or the references framed by the NAB were based on political vendetta. Uh, All right. Also, also, I think uh, now the way is clear. Uh, if, if the detailed judgment comes, the way is clear for uh, Mariam Nawaz to get her passport. She can travel, uh, she can go abroad and probably meet her father after a long interregnum. And probably they'll be consulting each other on the political situation uh, of Pakistan. All right. Javed Saab, uh, as far as the political landscape of the country, how much uh, will it change as a result of this verdict? I think it will have a big impact uh, because... Uh, Till this time, uh, PMLN top leadership, former prime minister, his daughter, uh, they were uh, under cloud. And uh, there were difficulties for them to prove to uh, their electorate and general public uh, that they were innocent and they had nothing to do uh, with those properties and that they didn't belong to them and all these kind of things. So once they get a relief from the court, uh, uh, from the High Court, Islamabad High Court, uh, probably that will be a big win for this family in the political context. And they will be able to uh, exploit this uh, legal victory uh, to their electorate and uh, uh, will take a mileage out of it. And probably in the coming elections, which uh, the opposition is demanding that they should be held immediately or as expected in a few months to come, then I think the, they'll, they'll have a big advantage in those elections because the opposition, probably the former prime minister was trying to exploit this situation, uh, they, that they didn't have a clean sheet from the courts, that they are uh, facing references in the court. And uh, his father, uh, her father, uh, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is a fugitive of law. And all these kinds of things, you know, all these kind of allegations will have no feet to stand. So this is a big victory, not only in terms of uh, 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 the law, but also in terms of uh, the politics of Pakistan. Probably they'll be uh, benefiting from it uh, in the coming elections, particularly in the province of Punjab, which has been the stronghold of EMLN.
All right, that, that, that's a very important development. So let's see how all of that changes in the months to come or the weeks to come. A final question to you, Safi, uh, and this, is, this has a political inclination. Shahbaz Sharif Saab, our Prime Minister, uh, tweeted that the edifice of lies, slander and character assassination has come crumbling down now that this decision has been taken by the Islamabad High Court. Uh, as Javed Saab has also pointed out, there is going to be a change as far as the political situation in the country is concerned. And of course, uh, the, 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 it, it goes in favor of the PMLN. Uh, what do you foresee politically in the months to come as far as both the PMLN and uh, the opposition is concerned? So obviously, uh, Maniam Nawaz is the vice president of PML Nawaz. And because of her previous conviction, she was unable to contest in elections. Now that she can contest in elections and go down, go back to her electorate, she, if depending on how charming she is and how persuasive she is, she might be able to garner sufficient strength. Uh, PTI has the province of Punjab at the moment, but historically, of course, we all know that it has been with PMLN. And with uh, uh, with a very popular figure, PML uh, Maryam Nawaz, and I think it's fair to say that she has, to a large degree, captured public imagination. She is she has come forth as a very popular leader, just like Bilawal Bhutto has in in this uh, she, she, dynasty politics that we have been seeing for a very long time. She is usually seen as the heir to the throne, and so if one was to one was to believe that way of thinking. It's, it's very clear that uh, you know the air is now able to compete uh, without any shackles that she previously had, hmm. and that does give of, her considerable. Of strength. course, of course, and uh, uh, thank you, Safi, for that point of view. Javed Saab, my last question to you is about the audio leaks. The audio leaks that have come out, and I, I'm specifically talking in reference to the audio leak uh, concerning the former prime minister. Is that going to uh, put a huge dent as far as their political ambitions are concerned? I think yes, uh, because uh, the entire narrative that was built uh, by former Prime Minister Mr. Imran Khan uh, that his uh, government was uh, overthrown uh, with the, with, through a conspiracy, an American-backed conspiracy of regime change in Pakistan. He was selling this narrative and using this uh, cipher, uh, this letter, uh, uh, to... to build his case. But now that this audio has uh, come up, I think uh, it will be difficult for him to sustain his narrative or to sell it effectively to the people. And uh, probably the opposition will now have the opportunity to expose uh, the reality, uh, you know, what, what's, what's uh, behind it and how this whole uh, narrative was fabricated to benefit uh, politically from this narrative. So I think uh, they will have a big challenge in future uh, to sell this narrative that Americans were involved, that a conspiracy was hatched against his government and he was overthrown. In fact, uh, some of the allies of uh, the former prime minister, like uh, MQM, uh, BOP, the Bloodstown Awami Party and some other parties were not happy uh, with Mr. Khan. And they thought that his style of governance was not uh, based on respect for his political allies and political leaders. They wanted uh, uh, Prime Minister to respect them. If he was not able to give them funds, development funds, and all these kind of uh, um, perks and privileges, he should have treated them with respect. That is what they wanted. But they thought that they were not being treated well. And even within his own party, uh, the PTI, some uh, stalwarts had this complaint that the former prime minister was not treating them uh, with respect. So uh, all these things led to the fall of the former uh, government, the former prime minister. So uh, now that this... Uh, narrative has been challenged or is being uh, challenged by the uh, government and his political opponents, or Mr. Khan's opponents, probably it will be difficult for him to uh, sell it anymore. And there will be a huge debate as to how this narrative was built and how the people were being uh, hoodwinked that uh, there was a conspiracy and that uh, the Americans were involved 
and at, at some stages, the former prime minister and uh, his allies had been uh, alleging that the Americans spent huge dollars uh, to destabilize his government. And uh, there was a lobbying by the U.S. Uh, diplomats to oust him from power mm. through this uh, no-confidence motion. I think so it's a lot of things have a lot of things have been unearthed as a result of these audio leaks, and let's see how that also changes the political landscape of uh, Pakistan. Thank you very much, Javed Siddiq, sir, to have joined us. Thank you very much, Barrister Safiullah Ghori, to have joined us to have talked to us about this very important decision taken by the Islamabad High Court that has annulled Maryam and Nawaz Safdar's sentence in the Avon Field reference, along with her and her husband, Captain Retired Safdar, have been acquitted in the Avon Field properties corruption reference after the Islamabad High Court over the July 2018 verdict. This is an important decision and this is going to change uh, politics or the political landscape of Pakistan. Only uh, the next couple of days and the weeks will give us more details as far as that is concerned and also when the detailed judgment of the Islamabad High Court comes. Let's come to our last two stories very quickly. Uh, the first being uh, Meta or of course the company that owns Facebook that uh, has been alleged by Amnesty International that it owes Rohingya reparations for the Myanmar uh, uh, violence. Facebook owner as per the Amnesty International faced, failed to take action on the hate speech against the Rohingyas despite repeated warnings. Uh, the rights group is right because on Meta following uh, the whole Rohingya incident, there was a lot of backlash against the Rohingya Muslims and uh, that uh, remained on the social media platforms when uh, it is an, an extremely important responsibility of, uh, of platforms such as Facebook or Meta, that the company that owns Facebook, to take care of any such sentiment that hurts uh, any uh, particular sect or religion or minority or majority and there it had failed and that is what uh, Amnesty International has said that hate speech is certainly a part of that as far as the Myanmar situation is concerned social media is Facebook and Facebook is social media and that is uh, where all of those comments were being heard and uh, that uh, was a very that had a very negative impact on the whole Rohingya situation and that is why the Amnesty International is now pinpointing its fingers to towards Meta. Finally, World Maritime Day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is today. It is being observed today across Pakistan. Uh, this year, the theme of the day is new technologies for greener shipping. Uh, uh, the Naval Chief Admiral Mohammad Amjad Khan has said that this year's theme reflects the need for greener transition of maritime sector for its sustainable future in line with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. He said efficient ports through their digitalization are needed to complement such a transition and newer technologies that he's in favor of said must therefore aim to reduce and prevent any adverse effects on the maritime environment and its uh, biodiversity. He also said that the Pakistan Navy is a major stakeholder in the maritime sector and it is well cognizant of the importance of creating maritime awareness and exploiting the full uh, the potential of the blue economy and that is how the Pakistan Navy is going uh, one step at a time uh, in the future. Uh, we wish uh, Pakistan all the very best on the World Maritime Day and of course all the personnel of Pakistan Navy. With that, we come to an end of today's newsroom, ladies and gentlemen. With, uh, we will see you, inshallah, tomorrow. That is Friday, the end of the week, for stories and segments that pertain to you, us, and Pakistan. Pakistan, as we know, as I always end my show with, uh, is uh, uh, under the impact of floods due to climate change. A lot of people have been impacted. So many are without shelter. Help them in whichever manner you can, directly or indirectly, through the government, through the NGOs, or through our armed forces. But do help them. Allah Hafiz.